Welcome to my session about drumming. Um, well, sort of about drumming. Not actually drumming per se, so much as having fun with my drum kit. So just to give a bit of background, um, we're not going to actually learn anything technical particularly today. You may learn a bit about how Roland drum kits work, um, but nothing that's likely to be useful to you. The point is to encourage you to uh, have fun with your own projects and think about how you can uh, make the most of having fun to also benefit your, your professional life. Um, and there'll be a few bits on C-sharp stuff. It kind of depends on how things go. Uh, this is one of those talks where because it's based on a live project that I am not constantly but often tweaking with, exactly what I talk about each time depends on what I've been tweaking most recently. Um, so we'll kind of see where we go. And if there are aspects that you particularly want to know about, um, then just shout out and, and ask. Um, I will say one thing to learn from this, and if you have time for personal projects, and if you have the money to invest in you know, however many Raspberry Pis you've uh, bought so that you can make a Kubernetes cluster of 128 Raspberry Pis or whatever, consider yourself privileged. And remember that privilege. Um, I am fantastically privileged. I have enough time to do this and enough money. And you know, this, is, this is my TD17. I'm going to be very excited to get home tomorrow night uh, because a TD27 is currently uh, it's out of Germany now. It's, it's in the UK and will be delivered to my home sometime tomorrow. And I get to play it on Saturday morning. Um, but only because of privilege. So that's sort of something to bear in mind all the time. This is my drum kit, effectively. Um, you know, this is a stock photo of it, but it's, it's the same kind of thing. Um, and I'd just like to point out the various bits to it. The module on the left-hand side, that's what I've brought along today. Uh, we'll see whether we've actually got time to sort of use it. Um, and that's the sort of brains of the kit. That's what turns everything else into sounds. Um, it's also got the MIDI interface. Uh, it's got a little uh, UI on the front of it. Um, it's the brain. A, a lot of drummers call it the brain of their kit. Everything else is just providing electrical signals. So, you know, there's snares and toms and hi-hats and cymbals and things. They're just providing electrical signals into this. And as you can see, you don't need the actual drums to be able to use this. Um, I could feed MIDI signals into this and get audio out and it would be as if I had the drums there. So this is all I kind of care about for the sake of this talk. I went and bought this kit in July last year, and I was with a friend of mine, Alice, um, and we were looking at a beginner's kit, sort of a TD1 DMK, I think it is, and this one, uh, which was more expensive and would be more for an intermediate drummer normally. You know, someone who knows how to drum pretty well. I'd never touched a drumstick in my life. But this looked more interesting to me because I looked at the, I don't know how well you can see, but it's got a reasonable LCD display on the front of this and lots of knobs and buttons um, that suggested to me that there would be a lot to tweak, a lot to configure. And I was immediately thinking, well, if there's a lot to configure, I wouldn't actually want to be doing it on here. I would far prefer to do that on something with a decent user interface, or at least uh, decent I.O. and a cobbled together by an amateur user interface, um, rather than something with you know, not terribly conducive things. If you're entering text on something like this, it's really painful. So I was thinking all of that in the shop when I was buying the kit, and that was a significant part of the decision to buy this kit rather than the cheaper one. And I'm very, very glad I did. I will now just skip to straight to Visual Studio to show you what the program I've written, um, or the UI part of it, is. I'm also working on a console version so that you can, in theory, use it from Raspberry Pi and stuff. Uh, this is in WPF, and it's in fairly bad WPF, because I am not, I'm not an application builder at all. I don't do web apps. I, don't do, I do console apps. I do quite a few console apps. Um, 
but this is WPF. It started off in Windows Forms, um, and I found that Windows Forms didn't perform terribly well with the things I was doing. So we can see uh, this is the sort of root window where it's mostly log, and it's where everything else sort of comes out from. You can see that it's detected that we do have the TD17 it's using MIDI ports uh, with name of 3 TD17. Um, so we could load the data straight from um, the device. And you can see that's taking quite a long time. I have a blog post. I, I'm starting a series of blog posts on this. And the way all of this happens is you need to think of the module as having this big block of memory where all the configuration is. And there's a lot of it, because it's got 100 drum kits on. Now, when I refer to kit, it, it gets a bit confusing when you think, I've got a drum kit. Well, this has got 100 kits on it. So it's currently on more cowbell. Um, and there are 100 different ones. You know, there's ones for pop, rock, rock uh, metal, etc., etc. And they've each got different configuration to say, well, this one's got a cowbell on the rim of Tom 2, or whatever it is. We'll, we can have a look at this precise kit in a minute. Um, so for each bit of data within that, I need to send a request. And the way that MIDI works, MIDI 1.0 and 2.0 has now come out, MIDI is unidirectional. So I send a request, and then there might be a response back. But it's not a response to my request. It's just you've got two streams, and you kind of hope that if you get something saying, here's some data, that it was in response to something you asked for. It isn't necessarily. Um, I can probably blow this up by doing, oh, OK, I'm not blowing it up uh, because I must be validating things. But me choosing different kits on here will be sending more data over MIDI saying, here's some information that I haven't requested. So this is all loading data, and it takes a long time. Uh, fortunately, I can load from a file instead. So let's take the TD17 data and get more of an idea. And this is all sort of for background for the rest of the talk, so you know what I'm talking about. So we can see we've got these 100 different kits. And I was talking about more cowbell, which is kit 31. And here we see the information about the more cowbell kit. So we can see the different instruments that have been assigned to the different triggers. So when you hit the snare, it will use a deep shell snare with a brass snare as a sort of sub-instrument. It layers the two things on top of each other. And we can see the details here. Um, there's all of this information. And this is why. If I were doing significant amounts of editing, I would want to do it on something like this, where I can just go into edit mode and you know, assign a different tom and change the volume easily and all, fiddle with everything in one place, rather than each of these settings being on one line of a, a tiny little display. OK, have you got the basic idea of the kind of app this is? And in, in particular, think that there are an awful lot, this is a tree view, there are an awful lot of nodes in this tree view. Um, and it's not just kits. There's also details about the different triggers and their um, sensitivity and things. And this is just the TD17. After a little bit of um, research, I found that the TD17, the TD50, which is the more professional um, drummer kind of uh, kit that you, know, you buy for five grand or so. Um, and now the TD27, uh, as of this year, they all have the same kind of MIDI implementation. So I thought, I want to be able to write code once that can work with all of these different kits, and I just need to tell it different schema information. So let's go back to where we were, hopefully. Um, so I mentioned a little bit about the protocol. I'm working towards the schema here. Um, I'll mention briefly the seven-bit addressing, partly because I wrote a blog post about that on Tuesday. So when you send a request to the drum kit, 
you say, I would like uh, information starting at this address and for you know, 250 bytes or whatever it is. But MIDI is a 7-bit protocol, as in the top bit of every byte in a MIDI message is reserved for either saying it's the end of the message or it's the start of the message or something like that. So in each byte, you only get seven bits of useful data. And Roland decided to make all of their documentation and the layout revolve around that. So every memory location has the top bit clear and the top bit of each byte. And they're 32 bit addresses. So really, they're 28 bit addresses because, you know, got four bits that aren't useful. But instead of saying, OK, it's a 28-bit address space, it's the bottom 28 bits, it's seven bits, useless bit, seven bits, useless bit, seven bits, useless bit, etc. This makes arithmetic really hard. Because 7f plus 1 is 100 instead of 80. I have not yet, I've isolated this in some of the logic of the code, but I find there are too many places where it's creeping through. And hopefully, yeah, uh, I will show you why here. So this is the documentation, and one of the things to take away from this is if you're building something that other people could use, write good documentation. The reference docs here, they, they take a little bit of, of getting into, but, but they are really, really good. I get the feeling that the engineers working on this module used this documentation themselves. Because I, I found a couple of mistakes in it, as I tend to. I like corner cases. Um, but it is really, really good and detailed. <coughs> if anyone could get me a glass of water, that would be much appreciated. Um, so here we have, this is the, the root. This is all of the data in the module. And you can see there are these sort of containers. That's my word for it rather than something in Roland. Um, but I have the idea that current is a container, setup is a container, trigger is a container, and each of these kits is a container. And they all have addresses in this, this one table. Thank you ever so much. Um, this one table has addresses. Brilliant. Thank you. Let's have a look at kit. So one kit has all of this. And this doesn't have actual addresses. This has offsets. So the kit common for kit one starts at three six zeros. And the kit MIDI for kit one starts three zero 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 one zero zero, etc. Start thinking about how you represent this within a schema. Okay, I want to have some way of writing, and I happen to have done it in JSON, but it's you know, however you want to represent it. You've got these offsets. And I don't want to write kit unit common one, kit unit common two, kit unit common three, I want to say, oh, kit unit common is a repeated field, effectively, with 20 elements, and they have a gap of 100 zero, zero between them. Except those gaps, so that the gap isn't an address, it isn't an offset, it's the difference between offsets. It's sort of second derivative. But those sometimes need to get gaps because uh, um, they, they skip bits again because of the seven bit addressing. Um, and it gets very, very, very confusing, at least to me. Um, this particular container doesn't show anywhere where the offsets start to have a gap. But I, I recently, this week, I tried to fix this up to be more sensible, and it half worked. But I think I'm actually going to have to redesign the whole thing to take account of this from the start. Um, and what I should have done is notice when my abstraction was leaking and said, right, stop. OK, the, this abstraction, I could keep making progress. And this was 
one of the things, because it's a personal project, you just keep going because you can make some progress. And I didn't stop to think, okay, this is going to bite me enough that it's going to be really painful to, to proceed. So I should have stopped, and as soon as the ab abstraction started leaking, revisit that abstraction. It turned out to be tricky for reasons that will become clear in a minute. So most of these, like these are all containers, but eventually, it's not containers all the way down, otherwise there'd be no actual data. But some of these containers um, contain actual fields. So kit MIDI will say, what MIDI note do you want to be emitted on the MIDI port uh, when you kick the kick pedal? And that's just a numeric field. But some of them are a little bit more complex because of these overlays. So if I go back into the Explorer, which I shouldn't have shut down, let's take uh, the kick. One, one of the nice things about this is um, every trigger is basically the same. So although I will show you what you can do with the kick, so this is when I press down with my right foot, um, what noise is going to come out. It doesn't need to be a kick. I could make it a cowbell, as if I were kicking a cowbell or a tambourine or whatever it is. So we can see that the, a kick, a, a normal kick drum, has ways of tuning it that you have tuning. So that will be just normal pitch. Um, muffling, so we can pretend that we've got tape on our kick head or a blanket inside the drum or a weight. And some snare buzz for you know how if if you um, play the if you kick the kick drum how much is that going to make the snare drum just buzz a little bit like it does in real life I gather I've never played on an acoustic kit. Now, does it make sense to have a blanket or a weight inside a cymbal? Okay, you probably don't need to be a professional drummer to say that doesn't make much sense. So let's see what happens if we have a symbol instead. Uh, so if I go to the instrument group of symbols, let's have a crash symbol. This just have a, has a size. It does have some muffling, but only tape, but several different tape options. Now, those bits of information, the kind of muffling, and whether it's size or tuning, those go into the same bits of the schema. And this is what I've called overlays. So which things are relevant depends on which instrument you've got selected. As a rather more um, dramatic example of this, if we look at each kit, you can talk about the multi-FX. So that's all kinds of stuff you can do with it to make it um, have delay or reverb or, you know, there are lots of options here. Um, and some of them do very weird things indeed. But they all have different options within them. So a T-Scream has a uh, distortion tone and level, whereas if we have an overdrive to delay, you've got the overdrive drive pan and then a tempo sync, um, and then um, feedback and a high frequency damp and, and balance. And even within this, there are some aspects that are conditional. So you see we've got a delay time if we put tempo sync on, we say we don't want the delay to be based on just a fixed number of milliseconds, but the crotchet beat, or whatever it is, that should have changed things. OK, bug. Uh, let's see whether that will be a bug in the schema, if I'm right. Um, no, it may just be a bug in the, the actual code. Someone remind me of that afterwards so I can go and fix it. Um, the idea is, when you've got the tempo sync on, that it, it should change the UI, should change from saying delay left milliseconds to delay left, um, left time note, and then offer you a drop down of crotchets and, and quavers and things. My point is that the schema suddenly becomes quite complicated, and when you've got a load of these for each of the 100 uh, kits, 
it would be really, well, I tried initially, my first attempt created a kit multi-effects for delay with all the parameters for kit one, and the same thing for kit two, and the same thing for kit three, and then also a kit multi-effects container for tape echo for kit one and kit two down to 100, and you end up with millions and millions of fields, literally millions, and just loading the schema and populating these potential fields was taking about 10 seconds on this fairly fast machine. Um, much more so for the TD50 than the TD17, but it was too much. Um, and if I'd stuck with that, then the problems I'd have with the 7-bit addressing weren't quite as bad, because I was always going address plus an offset to get to an address, and that's relatively straightforward. The fairly convoluted system I've got now, where you sort of dynamically load the containers, um, doesn't work quite as well with this 7-bit addressing. So the point is, schemas are difficult. Um, so these are, these are ex the, the sort of documentation examples of what I've just shown you. So um, the kit unit vedit container is documented to just have these parameters. And then each specific uh, instrument group has what those parameters mean. So, I've gone through about three different choices for representing schemas already in the history of things. I initially didn't have any of this JSON stuff at all. I'll show you the JSON in a minute. Um, I just wrote some code. I had you know, class module, and that had a list of kit, and a kit current, and a kit setup, and kit trigger maybe. Um, and then I thought, no, this is silly. I'm going to be writing code separately for the TD17 and the TD50 because they have slightly different layouts. They have different amounts of data. That's a really bad idea. This is effectively data. So I should write things as data. And now I will deliberately kill things so that I can show you the schema. So under this, I have the TD17 schema um, where if we look at the kit unit common, for example, we've got a bunch of JSON. It's fairly self-explanatory, so each field has an offset and a description, and depending on the type of the field, it's got ranges and things. This is all homebrew. There may well be decent schema representations that I could have used, um, but I just built my own because, for one thing, it was far more fun. And that had to include things like, I don't think, and someone can correct me if, if I'm wrong, I don't believe JSON has any kind of notion of include statements. Uh, so I had to build my own ones of those. So uh, the TD17 itself, so as a sort of root thing, talks about, oh, please include instrument groups.json here. So when I parse, I, I parse the, this JSON file and then look for any token that's a string value starting with dollar resource and then basically replace that token with the contents of the file. Feels to me like it's a really useful thing to have in JSON. I would be quite surprised if no one had done this more properly than I have. All of this is just for fun. Um, but it seemed, you know, as soon as I started doing that, it seemed to work really well. So I've got all these fields described in data because that's a useful way of doing things. But then I've got my WPF app. Now, I'm not very good at WPF. Really, really not very good. Um, and I tend to think procedurally. So I know there is all this MVVM stuff, but I don't use it at all, really. Um, I, tiny, tiny bits. And this is one of the things I, I want to start doing that properly. So I've got the idea of a data explorer. Um, and this is a fairly small amount of XAML. It looks like the scroll bar is tiny, but only because we can only see about seven lines at a time. Um, almost everything actually happens in this details panel, 
which is just, yeah, what, you know, it's just a stack panel somewhere. And then I populate that in code with, okay, this is the code that I happen to have up, but it's fairly um, representative. I build a load of GUI controls directly. And this is where Windows Forms fell over because, I mean, it didn't actually fall over, but when I navigated from one kit to another, it took a very, very long time to create all those controls, partly because each one was its own Win32 you know, native control, and I think it's just not built for being as badly programmed as I was doing it. So this clearly isn't the way that WPF should be done, but it works very well in terms of loading data from a schema that's dynamically driven. And all the WPF MVVM uh, examples I've seen have been, right, here's your view model with these handcrafted properties. So I could imagine a property of volume, a property of you know, uh, muffling that's backed by an enum or whatever. It's not clear how you make that dynamic, because I don't want to write all of those view models and views, and uh, sorry, uh, yeah, and views and the actual models. I could potentially generate all of those from the schema, but that feels kind of weird to do. Um, so I'm still, and anyone who's really interested in this, given that we have eight minutes left, uh, come and talk to me afterwards. I would love to just sit and doodle, you know, what could we do? If you know WPF well, that would be really interesting to do things. So those are some of the schema-related schema choices I've made. One thing I have done is separate out the WPF code from the um, raw data aspects. And there was one other interesting aspect that I uh, worked out I needed to do fairly early. If we look back at, uh, this is the description of a kit. Each of these things where there are 20 fields Field number one is for the kick head. Field number two is for, I think, probably the snare head. Field number three for the snare rim, etc. But they've got, what, uh, six diff uh, five different copies of it. So the common one, main one, sub one, uh, vedit main one, vedit sub one. And initially, I just displayed it like that. So you would have. The, the common part for each of them, and then the main part for each of them, the sub part, v edit main, etc. And then I rapidly decided that that was represent that was displaying the sort of physical view of the memory. And what we what we want to see, at least what I think as a UI uh, novice, I think we want to see is within each kick. Okay, show me everything about kickhead one. So the five different, I've had to group these five different elements, the common, main instrument, main v-edit, sub-instrument, and sub-v-edit. So as well as having the schema of what does, what does the module think it's got, there's separately, how do I want to display it? And that isn't really is that UI logic or not? Is that grouping of saying everything to do with the kick head is naturally related? That doesn't feel like it's WPF specific. So I haven't got that in information in the WPF view. That's part of the schema because it feels to me like it's inherent to turning what's the, the physical representation into something more logical. Again, I would love your views on have I done all this wrong? Should that part be in the WPF? But it does mean if I were to write, and at some point I will want to write a mobile app with Xamarin, I've got that same grouping. And it feels like it would be the same grouping. I could never want to see those five separate. So that's one thing I think I did right. <laughs> OK, so here we have. Even with an hour, I would not have got to all of these different um, aspects. Um, but these, these would be the next choices, and you know, come talk to me afterwards uh, if you 
care about any of these in particular. Um, as time is pressing, I will just mention a couple of aspects. So one is GUI inheritance, which I haven't found any good resources on. Um, I didn't show, but I was loading the whole module. And that's fine, but suppose uh, you just want to edit one kit and be able to load that one kit. You know, I've got a kit on here called Reach for um, when in church we do Reach by S Club 7, um, either just playing it or singing, a, singing some hymn words to it. Um, and so that's got some claps and some tambourines um, on you know, the, the, one of the toms and one of the cymbals. I would quite like to be able to send that um, kit to a friend and her load just that kit and then copy that onto the module and edit it as just one thing rather than the whole module. But I want the UI to look almost the same. It's, it's just a bit of that tree view with a few little different options at the top. Um, I will actually at this point, oh, it's, as it's running already. So um, here's the, the module explorer, but if I load a file that happens to say a vkit, we'll see it's got a different route at this point. Um, I can copy this kit directly. So if I say copy kit to 72, and then it will do it. And then if I navigate to 72 on here, you'll have to trust me that it's worked. But yes, it says reach. Hooray. Um, and if I... I said there was a clap. Ah, of course, that's now coming out. The headphones that aren't attached and the monitor that aren't attached are now playing a clap, clap noise. Um, but how, how would you, if your UI designers, represent the similarity between this and this in code? It's not just little bits that are the same. It's really, really very, very similar. Um, and the process I went through for this was I initially took a copy of the whole module explorer, called it Kit Explorer, got them both working, so removed a load of stuff from Kit Explorer, made it take a kit as the root element rather than a module, um, you know, effectively got to this UI with them as entirely separate things. Then created a copy of one of them. I, can't, I think I diffed at that point. So, right, how much is difference between this and how much is the same? Took everything that was the same, called that data explorer, then took the different bits and put those into subclasses. And that makes it sound slightly simpler than it was, but it probably took an hour or two, which certainly... Any task that you can do in one or two hours in a professional context, that sounds trivial, right? <laughs> um, when it's your personal time, it feels slightly more expensive. But that didn't feel too bad and has worked for extra things that I've added since. My guess is anyone who does WPF professionally for a living uh, will come and you know, very politely want to say, no, John, you are completely wrong there are better ways of doing this. You know, prefer composition over inheritance? Absolutely, I just don't know how. Which leads me to the sort of conclusion here, this reflections on the experience. I have learned so much. I also haven't learned so much in that I've got open questions about how do I represent this as MVVM, etc. I've learned about MIDI. I've learned about getting an Authenticode certificate and having to go to a notary and all of this, uh, I've then created an MSI with Wix, um, which I'd never done before. I've tried to convert that to MSIX this week and failed, but I'll try again another time. There has been so much to learn, some of which may eventually make it back into my professional life. Definitely aspects on, yeah, when your abstraction starts leaking, just stop. Really, really stop soon. Um, things around, I haven't talked about the immutability problems that I had um, with how do you represent. A schema should know about the fields in it, because otherwise it's pointless. But it's really helpful for a field to know about the schema. 
Which one of those do you construct first, given that they've got to know about each other? It's the, the perennial problem of uh, in, uh, immutability in C-sharp. So I've sort of noodled on things quite a lot on that front, um, finding out about nullable reference types and how when you're loading stuff from JSON, everything should be nullable, because, hey, who knows what's actually going to be there? And then as part of validating that and then constructing something that you know more about, you end up with a bunch of code duplication. And that's OK, because they are representing slightly different sort of views on the same, the same things. But the big, big, big thing that I will close with is I've had so, so much fun. And I've got to talk at conferences like this. And I do occasionally do some drumming as well. Um, so go away and do something similar. And it doesn't matter if it never makes it to a blog post. If you can make it into a blog post, open source code, conference talks, that's fantastic. But the main thing is just have some fun. Thank you very much.